All right, Seventh Gear fans, we are back for the season premiere of, of season two of the Seventh Gear Show, and I am here. I, I, I can't even tell you how excited I am for this interview. This gentleman to my right will get his due introduction in just a second, but I got to tell you, it's been a whirlwind couple of days. We had a fantastic 2017 initial inaugural season of the Seventh Gear Show, and I want to thank everybody for tuning in as often as you did. We're we're going to do that much more this year. We've got great guests on tap. Um, You've heard about those already from my opener, but uh, this gentleman right here, I, I, I've only known him for <laughs> about an hour. We got introduced through a mutual friend of ours, but I can already tell you from what little I've already known about this gentleman, I'm already a fan. Uh, we have very similar backgrounds, yet different. Um, he's a racer, first and foremost, but he's also a dad, he's a businessman, really successful, a leader in his, in his industry. We've got a lot of stuff to cover on the Seventh Year Show, so Without wasting any more of your time, it, honestly, this whole show, I could sum it up in, in two words. It's dirt and alcohol. But <laughs> for sure, right? <laughs> for sure. But it's way more than that. So I want to take, uh, take a minute here and introduce my new friend and friend of the Seventh Year Show, Mr. Jim Riley, who's the CEO of the Baja United Group and so much more. Jim, thanks so much yeah. for having us here oh, on I'm the show. I'm excited to have you out here. Oh, well, Dave, right. yeah, I'm telling you, I, I get excited about all kinds of stuff, but I haven't been this excited once I got to know more about you and your background than, than I am right now. So well, thank you very much. No, no pressure on the interview today. Make sure it's exciting. <laughs> it's going to be exciting. This is, as they say in Indianapolis, stay tuned for the greatest spectacle in racing. Well, we're on location here in Costa Mesa, California, so stay tuned for the greatest spectacle on the internet. Here well, we go. I, I like to say, get out of your comfort zone, right? You know, because it is dirt. So, uh, yeah, happy to be on the show. Happy to meet your acquaintance. Yeah, it's only been about an hour, but I kind of had to cut the conversation off because we were just going. I thought maybe we should be filming this. Well, right. This is this is one of those where it's it's almost like you know when people say, oh, we should film a reality show on this just because of the stuff that winds up getting talked about, and it's like yeah. then by the time you think to do it, it you you lose it. So that was a that was a good. So Jim Riley is, uh, and like I said, folks on the Seventh Year Show, he and I have kind of similar backgrounds, similar, uh, which is what I, I really appreciate about him. We both kind of started our own deal. Now, Jim started in off-road racing. Now, Jim, was that about, was it seven, eight, nine years ago, roughly? Well, almost into our 10th year right now. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, time just flies when you're in this world because between schedules and meetings and then dealing with sponsors and getting that all geared up each year, all of a sudden it's like, Wow, we've been doing this almost 10 years. It's crazy. Yeah. So now you're racing trophy trucks right now. Yeah, technically they're what they're called is spec trophy trucks. So it's like the NASCAR of off-road. So a uh, trophy truck is literally unlimited everything, whereas in the spec class, uh, we've got a spec motor, spec transmission, and a spec size tire. Outside of that, you can kind of do your own thing. I got gotcha. you. So now when you got started in all this almost 10 years ago, what did you start in? What was the progression... I, I've heard the story, but the Seventh Gear viewership has not. So Seventh Gear Nation needs to hear this because this is a pretty, pretty cool story about how Jim got started and how he built up to where he's at now, as successful as he's been in, in trucks. So Jim, if you wouldn't mind. Well, and and I think what's what's neat about the story, um, considering your viewership and people that might be listening here, is that you know a lot of times we aspire to go do something, right? I want to go race that car, and you, and you see these people that you want to be like or do something that they're doing. And um, for me, every year I had a lofty goal to try and achieve something that I could be proud of or some type of physical challenge. Um, my early challenges were I climbed some mountains like Mount Whitney and Mount Rainier, you know, into the volcano and stuff. But um, so this movie came out called Dust to Glory uh, and it covered off road and it was just a really uh, a great movie, job well done. Um, and I thought, man, I want to go do that. Because I remembered as a kid, 1971, my dad did the Baja 1000 pre-run and was at the finish line when those race cars arrived. And this is, it was very raw down there in 71. And the reason why I have that memory, two reasons, is he brought me back a poncho from Mexico. So, you know, my picture's right. in the poncho. But the second thing that's really cool is that he has a Polaroid of the finish line and the and the winner of the race. Well, uh, what was so epic about that Polaroid is that VW Magazine, February of 1971, ran a picture of the finish line winner 
in the background. There's my dad with the Polaroid camera, and in those days you had to hold a flash up here. Oh yeah, taking the picture. I'm like, there's my dad, and here's the picture that's in VW magazine. How so, cool is that? So uh, the, the, the point of that is, is that I, I aspired after seeing this video, like I got to go race that race, you know. And um, if if you've seen any of my philosophies or some of my posts. Um, my philosophy is the answer is always yes, right? The answer is yes. Don't be afraid to try something and be something. And uh, by saying yes, you'll get there. So uh, here I'm in my corporate career, wearing a suit and tie every day. I see the movie, you know, like I gotta go do that. Well, of, of all things that happened, I met a, a gentleman by the name of Cameron Steele, um, who's really kind of an X Games guy. Um, he's done a lot of color commentating. I know he's been out sure. to Long Beach, the yeah. Grand Prix and stuff. I met Cameron. I mean, phenomenal uh, announcer and off-road racer. And uh, I happened to meet him through my career at Kettle One Vodka. And it was shortly after this movie came out. And I said, hey, Cameron, like, how do I get involved with that? And um, I'll give him 100% credit for all the money I've spent in off-road. <laughs> <laughs> I, I yell at him every time I see him. But, you know, he says to me, he goes, look, Jim, in Baja and off-road, everybody's welcome. We're all family down there. And uh, a lot of people can say that, but how many people actually mean that? And he really meant it. So uh, I said, well, I want to come down. I want to watch a race and, and see how I can get involved. Well, he called me a week later and says, Jim, there's a, there's a racer. He's got three seats in his race truck, which is very rare. He goes, uh, if you're willing to pay a little bit of money to get in that truck, um, you can race the San Felipe 250 in a trophy truck. You know, this truck is 750 horsepower. I've never been in an off-road vehicle before, but my first one, I'm going to go straight to the top. Right on. And ride with this guy. Go big or go home. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, <laughs> so I said, all right, tell the guy yes, I'll give him the money. And then I started thinking about, like, well, I know a lot of people that might sponsor my effort. And uh, Vitamin Water, actually, uh, they sponsored my effort to go down there and race with this guy. And uh, we put together a neat marketing plan to promote the brand while we were down there. He's like, yeah, you can take as much room as you want in the car. Just you know, pay me, right? Sure. So uh, I, I did a, uh, what I think to be a pretty decent job of marketing those efforts. And uh, after the race, Cameron came back to me. He goes, hey, man. He goes, I thought you were, you were my guy. I'm like, yeah, but you told me to go race with that guy. He goes, tell you what, let's make a deal. Right? <laughs> so uh, the deal was um, I would do all Cameron's marketing and help with his sponsorship uh, you know, relationships. And in return, I'd get to race in his trophy truck. Uh, for the season as his navigator and I just thought that's a great way to start Racing and it was so excited to be down in Baja um, I've been surfing down there since 1983 so to go down there to uh, race instead of surf was a great opportunity for me And uh, I started my race career with Cameron Steele in the top class You know 750 horsepower monsters just like I saw in the movie You know, so That's I awesome Ran that for two years with him So and now is in the almost 10 years now since you've racked up a pile of wins yeah. championships what's i mean what appeals to you now i mean like in terms of what's the next goal what's the next step what do you what do you want to accomplish with it well it, you know I, I think what's always been important for me in off-road and that was that mantra that cameron said you know everybody's welcome and uh, you know, you know, racing—it's hard. You know, to get a win. I, I had somebody tell me after my actually it was—I think it was Cameron that told me after my first win. He goes, "Jim, those don't come very often. Don't get used to it." Right. You know, cherish and, that. And he was absolutely right. We had a great win early on in my career when I when I had my own team or when I started my own team. He's like, "Don't get used to it." But what I realized also at that first race that we had won was the camaraderie out at the course. You know, you've got this team of guys. And it's really about them. You know, you're just the driver. These right. guys are these guys are the one, the ones that are putting this car out on the track and giving you a vehicle that you can go out there and win with. And it's the times that you don't win and you have these big challenges. You know, like changing out a transmission in the middle of the night in the oh, desert because yeah. we can do that in our series. And it's like, wow, these guys pulled together and, and we actually hit the finish line. I don't care if we won or lost, but we made it to the finish line. In this incredibly hard race and these guys did it so to answer your question you know next steps for me is about creating more of those opportunities for for my guys to come out and participate in a race in different and fun ways um, we'll be making some announcements as we lead up to the uh, the famous mint 400 it's their 50th anniversary right and we're gonna be working with a spectacular team from another country to put a race car out on the on the course and um, I'm more excited for my, my mechanics 
to come out. Matter of fact, I was talking to him before the show about this this effort. You know, we're just the build up. Like, okay, this is what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to put the car out there. You know, so I, I'm I'm looking forward to creating more experiences for the team in the future, and see what we can accomplish together. Well, and you know, that's a really great point because you know, it, you also a, as a family man, you, you you get to that point, especially maybe as you get older and you've had a lot of these experiences, both in life and in racing, where it's it's less about you. And it's more about everybody else, whether it's your guys, your sponsors, your partners, your family members that are sacrificing just as much time because you're away from them as, as the mechanics and the guys putting the car together mm -hmm. are. So you want to make sure that they're, you know, they're recognized and they're getting something out of it and they realize how much you appreciate them. Because I think that goes a long way. And I'm, I'm sure from, the, from just that story that you told, I'm sure your guys would, would do anything for you. Yeah. And my guys were the same way. You know, uh, the first season we ran a world challenge, you know, I, we had a problem with the clutch, lost two clutches and we were going to, we were almost going to go a 12 hour drive to, to Watkins Glen to get the only other one that we could find yeah. in the country. And they would have done that for sure, me sure. because of how they were treated. And that's kudos to you for, for knowing. You, you got to be good to people and they'll be good back to you. And, and I can't tell you how many times I've been out at the track and other team guys will sneak over and be like, hey, if you need some help, man, you know, I'll, right. I'll help you at the next race. And that's always shady stuff. Yeah, yeah, and, and but but for me, I take it as a compliment because you know they see how we're working together and, and we've got that team element, we've got the barbecue going and stuff. Right. And, and not all teams offer that, you know, so um, I, so it's a big priority for me to, to take care of the well, guys. And, and you know, to that point too, it's like it, what I've learned over the years, and I'm sure, I'm sure you would agree with that, is like it doesn't matter what the business or the industry is. It doesn't matter if it's wine, if it's transmissions, if it's a fast food restaurant. It always, always, always comes down to the people. Yeah, it's got it. It's got it. Yeah, and, the, and the, the earlier, for you young racers out there, the earlier you learn that, the better off you're going to be and the longer your career is going to be. Yeah, and don't don't take these people for granted. I mean, in our world, most of them are volunteers. That's right. You know, and, and I, I start to get a little guilt factor because I'm thinking, wow, we, we race six to eight races a year, and they have to take vacation time to come out and race with us. And right. It's really just about being out there and being involved in something. And so I really have to remember to treat them like, hey, this is their vacation. Sure. You know, um, we bought a really nice RV that we can kind of use and hang out, and we bring the the speakers out and the music. Our, our pits are much different than what you guys might experience. We, you know, we try to create that fun environment, you know, pre and post race. And, um, you know, I think they appreciate that. Everybody gets t-shirts and hats and, yeah. you know, we try to bring it. We actually, one season we ran, um, every race we raffled off something amongst the team guys, like a set of tires or rims or something that they could use back at home. Um, you know, so that was a fun year to be doing that, you know, just to, just to build them up and, and have them enjoy the process. That's very cool, and and you're absolutely right. That's a great way to treat those guys. And then you know, I had a similar relationship with the guys that were working on on my race car too, because you know, at the end of the day, when they're, they're under there in, in the grease and the muck yep. and everything, and, and you're going, sorry guys, that's all I can do. <laughs> but thanks thanks for doing that. I'll, that that recognition goes a long yeah. way. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely right. So you kind of put when you got started, you kind of did it sort of the old school way like I did. You know, you, you, you approach people, you, you didn't really know what you were doing, you, but you figured doing something's better than doing nothing if yeah. this is what you want to do. So you figured out how to do it and you want to kind of, like you said, you, you built up your own team for a while, you had a shop, you had, I mean, talk a little bit about how you, how you achieved that from ground zero. Well, um, uh, there's a philosophy I heard from the founder of Chobani Yogurt and, and, and his whole deal is, you just start walking in that direction that you want to go, and eventually you'll be where you want, right? So when he started that company, for the first three weeks, all they did was paint the building that they bought because they were moving in a direction. They didn't even have a business plan, right? So when I when I looked at racing, it was like, okay, well, let's just start walking in that direction. It's almost laughable. The first race car I bought, I bought it new, and uh, my neighbor and I conjured up like, okay, we're going to go do this. And I bought this car, and we started talking about, you know, how do we maintain it and work on it. He's like, oh, I'll just work on it in my garage, right? We didn't even know how to adjust the shocks, you know, <laughs> which is the most important part of an off-road vehicle. Right. Um, but we were determined and, and what happened was, thank God it was a new vehicle. We took it out to the first race. I rolled it on the first lap just for the record, you know, new guy. Been um, there, done that. Yeah, right. Yeah. We rolled it back over and we kept uh -huh. going. 
the other thing I love about off-road. Um, but you know, after the first race, we're like, okay, now we know what we need to work on. First, we need a couple more people to help, and, and you start developing that plan. And uh, the second race, we did a little bit better, and, and we, had a, we were a little bit more organized. Uh, but we weren't shy about talking about the, uh, so I had founded a company called Azunia Tequila, and uh, that was our title sponsor on the car. We weren't shy about the fact that, hey, you know, we have tequila. <laughs> And um, I wound up forming a partnership uh, with a guy by the name of Rick Johnson, who, who was actually, uh, the race that I met him at, they were winning the championship that day, but they were also retiring their vehicle. And so around a, around a margaritas, actually, Rick and I started talking about the following year, and he goes, well, maybe we should partner up. And uh, you know, again, I think it's uh, about saying yes and being open to other ideas and partnerships and figuring out or formulating a plan how you can do what you love to do. And basically Rick said, look, we'll teach you how to drive this thing. We'll help you dial it in and we can provide some guys. You bring the tequila every time. You know, and of course I had the financial resources to do that. And, and we formulated a team where we won two championships in a row. We actually won every race that we could win in that truck together. Wow. So, um, you know, by being open to him um, and suggesting and, and evaluating, like, does this make sense at the time of my career? And not having that ego. You know, I'm sure you've seen that at the track. Guys come out, they've got the money to be out there. Maybe they, they were fortunate enough to qualify or be in a position to go race, but it doesn't mean they have the talent. All right. You know, and that's oh, how you yeah. wreck cars real fast. That's right. Um, and, it, and it's very dangerous. So um, I recognize, although I'd spent two years in Cameron's race truck and two races driving, that I still didn't have the driving ability. And, um, you know, it's a real check at the door with your ego to say, yeah, you know what, I'll, I'll take some help on how to drive this thing. And oddly enough, Rick was a champion racer, but uh, his son, Lewis, coming up through the ranks, um, was a, a great teacher. Um, and Lewis was younger than I was, so I actually, uh, I, I took a side seat to Lewis and let him teach me how to race the car, um, you know, in race scenario and in test scenario. I got really good because of that, you know, but I, I had to check my ego out the door. But that's, that's how you start building a foundation to go out and win races. And that was really smart on your part, and you were humble enough to accept that because you're absolutely right. I mean, I see it all the time where you know people that have the money to go race think that the, they bought the talent to go with it, yeah. and they're not necessarily you know, they can't always check that ego at the door to realize that they need some some work to get them to the point where their checkbook actually. Yeah, is. I find it really interesting. Maybe you see this, and uh, you know, if you start a racing career, you know, people watching, you'll see this too. But you know, people that know you in everyday life, you know, your best friend or your brother, you know. Um, they think they can go out there and race these cars because they know you, they know your personality. Like, oh, I'm as good as he is, you know, right. it's my best friend. But um, it, it does take uh, a lot of uh, skill that you need to learn and you need to put the hours in the vehicle. That's right. You know, and, and a, lot of, a lot of my friends are like, oh, when are you gonna let me drive that car? It's like, probably never, <laughs> you know? Right. Because I don't want you to die, first of all. It's a, this is a weapon, you know, out in the course. This thing's capable of doing 130 miles an hour, um, you know, in, in the dirt. So, uh, but people don't understand that, you know. Well, and you know, it, it reminds me of something that I heard you say in, a, in another interview is all about coming in prepared. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's from your own driver preparation of, of your your skill and your and your teaching, or your your pursuing your partners, you know, being prepared to talk to them. Yeah. I mean, that preparation mm -hmm. on every level. I mean, I know when I was first getting started. Uh, you know, I worked in the SECA. As a, I worked in timing and scoring for a while. I worked in tech inspection for a while. I was a corner worker. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, and even Skip Barber had a deal back in the day where you could go and be a corner worker at their races and yeah. get credits towards a class. So that kind of helped me too until I got to the point where I could actually financially pull the trigger. But yeah, it's sure. like you said, it's about being prepared. And a lot of these guys... Yeah, they see, you know, mild man or Jim or Kevin out there and they're like, well, if they can go race a truck or a car, so can I. Well, it's like, that happens yeah, it's all not, the time, right? Not how it works. <laughs> yeah, it's a different deal. But, um, you know, and one of the other things that I really appreciated that, uh, that I heard you say in, in uh, this other interview, and, and you and I kind of appreciate the same individual, is a guy named Gary Vaynerchuk. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as you said about the Chilvani guys, you know, you just start working toward, walking towards something, you know. And one of the things that I loved about what Gary Vaynerchuk said is like, at some point, you know, you can read and talk and discuss all you want, but at some point you gotta take action. Yeah. Whether it's the right action or the wrong action, you gotta sometimes just go do something. 
Well, and, and it's about willingness to take that action as well, right? And, and step out of your comfort zone. You know, mm -hmm. it's too easy to stay in this in this lane here. That's right. And stepping out, you know, and and again, when you when you look at what we do, you know, in the race car and living in this world, um, you know, people aspire to be there. A lot of those people could be doing what we're doing, but they don't want to step out of their lane, right? Right. They don't want to do the work to get there. Right. And, and so often, I just hear that in life. It's like, oh, if only. Well, if only you started walking in that direction, absolutely, you right. could be there right now because you've been saying if only for the last five years, right? That's right. And uh, for me, you know, jumping in with Cameron and and building that foundation, I knew I knew I wanted to have a team, so I started working towards that, right? Like, what do I got to do? How much money do I have to save? And uh, you know, how, how's this all going to go down? And then once you're there, it's just building upon that foundation that you've built, right? Exactly. And, uh, so I, I love to encourage people to um, take action, like like Gary says, you know, take action and, and start working in that direction. Go do it. You can do it. You can do anything you want to do. Absolutely. And it, it applies to anything in life, whether it's racing or a career path or, you know, yeah. whatever it happens to be. Um, so we talk about a, a lot of those things. I mean, those life lessons and so forth. Now, you, you sort of, as we talked, you had that, that food and beverage background. You had started the Azunia Tequila mm -hmm. Company. This starts seventh gear nation this starts to kind of transition a little bit of our conversation but then you also held the title of marketing vp at kettle one right which also then gave you a very unique perspective on the commercial and i hesitate like you do to use the word sponsor relation mm -hmm. i tend to like you to use the word partner because i've always kind of approached it as it's got to be a win-win for everybody, and yeah. if it's not, it's a lose-lose ultimately sure. anyway. Sure. So you've got to treat them as partners. But talk a little bit about how the development of Azunia, which you used as a primary sponsor in your, in your truck days early on, and then also your role at Kettle One, how that sort of gave you some more perspective on the whole commercial aspect of motorsports partnerships. Yeah. Well, you know, let's be clear, 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, there were genuine sponsorships. We're going to pay you to have our sticker on your car, and that was good enough, right? Because uh, pre-recession, you know, in the early 2000s, and, and money was and good. Money was good, man. It was everywhere, and 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 big brands wanted to say they were associated with something, you know. And I, I like to think back on the Monster uh, Energy Drink days, my Kettle One days, Patron Tequila days. You know, thing money was flowing hard. I mean, there was great parties everywhere. I, I'm like, we're in LA, you know, so <laughs> right. great parties everywhere. Uh, you know, we're flying our helicopter to work, you know, just things were just crazy out of control. But there was a global shift in, in, in sponsorship and the expectations of those dollars. And, and that's, I think that's what you're asking now because there's no such thing as a traditional sponsorship anymore. It's a partnership. And um, you need to approach it that way. And it's been that way my whole entire race career now. And that's why we've been very successful to have partners. Some of them I've had since day one. Um, and some have come and gone for their own purposes, but most likely not mine. And that's because I've always treated them as a partnership. And you know, when I was at Kettle One, uh, we sponsored not only some professional athletes, uh, we sponsored James Worthy, Peter Jacobson, Arnold Palmer, um, Scott McCarron. Uh, but we also sponsored some musicians and events. Uh, we helped Michael Buble get his career off the ground through sponsorship. Um, but one thing I realized there is that uh, these these brands and these people I'm talking about were really good at, at bringing something to the table more than just give me some money and I'm going to put your sticker on my whatever, right? Right. right. And uh, so I took that philosophy and applied it to my race team. Um, you know, when I was at Kettle One. And then when I launched um, Azunia Tequila, what I knew, and, and for, for business owners out there, you know, take this as a great lesson. I knew that if I'm gonna start a new business, what better way to start than in this off-road community that I've got a following, we've had some success. Um, I've got my network of friends and family out at the track, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm gonna launch my tequila within this circle. And uh, what I found, and I think most people would be pleasantly surprised with, is the amount of support you get from your colleagues in something that you love, right? So in my case, this was racing. I launched my tequila company, 
and uh, the fellow racers and sponsors and organizations, it was kind of open arms. You know, it's like, hey, yeah, we'll, we'll go buy a bottle. We'll go try what you're doing or we'll go to your party or we'll support you. Or by the way, I own this restaurant or I'm the president of MGM. You know, it's like, wow. So all these doors opened up within my own community. And uh, so that sponsorship of my truck and really we're a startup, so no money came to my truck from the tequila company. We just put a logo on there and we were promoting it, right? Sure. But it did pay dividends for the company, you know, to be successful early on and create that snowball. So, you know, for business owners and people that are trying to uh, make more out of their race program and their own businesses, realize that you've got a community of people more than likely they're going to be there for you. And don't be afraid to kind of reach out and say, hey, look, I'm trying to start this business or grow my business, whatever, whatever position you're in. So it worked really well for me. But it did bring more sponsors to the table because they saw how I treated my brand and the vehicle and, and the arms are the extensions of that sponsorship. Uh, they saw that live in action. And uh, that's, what, that's what kept the sponsors coming in. Right, exactly. And, and there's a couple things there that I, I want to kind of circle back on. Um, before the, it gets lost in, in the interwebs. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, you, you had mentioned uh, at the beginning of that particular thought that there was a global shift in sponsorship. About what do you think that was and when do you think that that happened? What, well, what was that seminal moment where it shifted in your mind? Yeah, for, for me, and, and you know, this is my own personal opinion based on what I was doing at Kettle One at the time and then transitioning into my tequila company, is that it really felt like, you know, when that recession hit 2007, 2008, everybody reevaluated their money. You know, companies are looking at, okay, wow, we've been transporting people via helicopter when they can drive the 20 miles, or we're spending 100 grand on this party out in Vegas for our athletes when we could do something a little bit more efficient that they might enjoy more. You know, and I think that we all reevaluated our company budgets, and marketing is always the first to go, anyhow. And in the marketing budget, sponsorships really yeah. the first to go. Yeah, absolutely. You know, right. so I, I think globally, you know, we all had to get smarter as business people running our companies and how we were spending those marketing dollars, right? So instead of you know transitioning, we just cut the cord. You know, boom, done. And then what I think um, from a sponsorship perspective, I think. Companies slowly climbed back into that arena, but in a smarter way. You know, said, look, we realize there's an importance of sponsoring something or being involved in that activity, but we need to see a return on that more than, hey, my sticker's on your car, on your shirt, on your race suit, or your helmet, right? What's the return on it? No, we want to see some partnerships and what do those look like, right? So um, it forces us as athletes to be better marketers. Um, I think there's actual benefits to that because it opens more doors, you know. So just as an example, what I did in my world is, uh, so let, let's just use my tequila company as an example that I was running back in the day. So I've got this race car with the logo on there and the goal of the tequila company would be to sell more tequila, right? Sure. And I'm going to do that on my car. But what I learned is, well, if I went to this bar down the road and I brought my race vehicle into town a day early. I said, hey, look, this race is coming to town. We can park the race truck out in front, you know, to drive some attention. You're two miles from the racetrack and I'll start promoting online. We're doing a pre-party at your bar with a drink special of Azunia Tequila Margaritas. All of a sudden, you worked a full circle program, right? From the brand to the athlete to the sale of the product to the consumer that's going to try that product maybe for the first time everybody's happy right, right? and you can do that win, across win, win. The board. it's a win-win for everybody and you can work that across the board with probably almost every sponsor you have um you know a good example is i was doing um some uh, dealer incentives for general tire when I, when I was running their tires and I'd go to Vegas and do some dealer incentives. So I was kind of that middle of that circle for them. Sure. You know, and, and I had offered the opportunity to go do that. And they're like, yeah, we'd absolutely love to have you out there meeting some of our dealers and motivating them and seeing what you're doing, you know, so it was an added value to their project. So, uh, you know, I don't want to say it's thinking out of the box because it really isn't, but it's thinking about other people's business model and what makes sense for them to sponsor you and why. Well, and I think to that point, it's, you know, with that, that shift and when it really, when the economy turned there, you know, 708, because it cost me a, an Indy Lights program, mm -hmm. but for as, for as quickly as that well ran dry, so to speak, the, the upshot of that is that it forced us all to be smarter about yeah. how we approached people and 
putting together a comprehensive package to actually make sense for a, a potential partner. Yeah, sure. So in that regard, I'm, I'm kind of liking that because it, it makes you think, and that's the way it really should be. Well, what it also does is it makes these sponsorships more valuable for the sponsor and also increases that longevity of the relationship because they realize, okay, we've got a program here that has some legs to it. Why would we cut that off? And the reality is, and I'm not afraid to say it, you know, in public, towards the end of um, 2017, in my relationship with General Tire, they're like, look, you, you bring us more value as a marketer than as a racer, right? Are you hearing that seventh gear nation? <laughs> well, you know, and, and the truth is, you know, we had a we had a rough sixteen and seventeen. Um, we we won some smaller series races, but in the big series, we didn't win any races. We we were fighting for a podium, and uh, you know, sponsors want wins because they're going to leverage that, but they also want to market the brand. And they said, look, you, you, we have you here because you're a great marketer for the company. Which, by the way, as a driver, takes a tremendous amount of pressure off. You know, you, you can actually go out there and race a little bit better because you're not so worried about I got to win or I'm not going to get paid. 100%. Um, but you know, that's a, a nice compliment for what my my other abilities are to market their brand, right? So uh, it it was a compliment to our program and that we were going in the right direction. Fantastic. So, and and that sort of leads to the next thing that that you and I have talked about a little bit, um, even even prior to to the show right now. With sort of about that same time, that 0708 era, that's a lot of when social media really started. Mm -hmm. So now you've got both the good and the bad of that, right? Right, yeah, sure. <laughs> it, exactly, so, and that's one of the things that as, as seventh gear, as you're looking behind Jim, we're gonna get into uh, here in just a second, but that also, it, it used to be where all the social media stuff, that was like the, that was the coming man sort of thing. Mm -hmm. you, that was the, the your, you were ahead of the curve if you were doing that, well now, Everybody's doing that. Yeah. You got everything. You got Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, the whole gamut. So now the challenge is to differentiate yourself, isn't it? Yeah. So what have you found with your own racing, let alone the, the wine that we'll, again, we'll get to in a second, but what have you found that helps you to differentiate without giving away any trade secrets? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I think what my approach, not, not, I don't think I know what my approach is this year. Um, and this may or may not work for everybody, but I made a conscious effort mid-2017 for 2018 sponsors to go to them and say, look, we've been doing this and it's been working, but you know, I wanna maintain my value for you. So let's talk about what your actual strategy is for your company. What are your touch points at this company, right? Because if we're not doing that for you, then we're not providing a good value for your sponsorship. And I'll give you a great example uh, of a conversation I had in 2017. Uh, Rugged Radios is one of my sponsors, and, and they provide race radios for the race car, communication, GPS, and then some other components. Well, one of the things that they're really good at, and I didn't realize how good they were because I've always had their parts, is our, our air intake system, right? They, they call Parker Puppers. So they're in the rear of the vehicle, um, they flush fresh air into your helmet in that environment there, right? And uh, the idea is to keep them dust free and working strong so you've got good air intake, clean air intake, keeps them inside of your visor clean the whole bit. But what I didn't realize about them until I asked that question, right? Because I've been reposting their stuff all of 2017 and doing what I thought that they needed. I said, well, what is your strategy? What are your needs for next year? And they said, well, Jim, honestly, we need more video content in car racing, showing the dust coming through the windshield and talking about the value of our Parker pumper. I mean, it's, it's a great item. We've, we're innovative in our technology and we want people to know that. And I, and I looked at the guy and said, wow, I would have expected you guys had all that already and, and had all the video content you needed. He said, no man, if you can deliver a little bit of video content, we would be thrilled. Right? So if I never asked that question, I would continue about the way I was doing it and not understanding what their real needs were. And kind of going down a little bit of an off path with what they needed, which 
if you go down the road, figuratively speaking, yeah. could have ended that partnership yeah. prematurely or not extended it as long as it could have been. Yeah, they could have said, look, you know, we're not really getting what we need out of Jim, you know, for no other reason than the fact that I didn't ask and they didn't tell. Right. And, and that goes back to your earlier point, which I agree with 100%, is you got to come prepared. Anybody that's doing this, you, me, or anybody watching, do your homework. Yeah. You know, and it's... And again, it, it, you can extrapolate this into any aspect of life. If you don't come prepared, you're only going to get so far. Well, you also have to look at how do I add value to this company that's willing to sponsor me. And, and listen, we're, we're competing for those dollars, right? Every right. racer is competing for dollars that are being spent in that segment. And those slices of that pie are getting smaller and, and smaller and every smaller. year. And then that's only one pie of probably several within a company. So we're competing for those dollars. So by going to them and saying, how can I deliver what would be a successful sponsorship for you? By asking that question, writing it down and incorporating it into your race program is where you're gonna see that success. Because when it comes time to cut a budget or cut a team or, or, or something that's not gonna involve you anymore, they can look at you and go, you know what? They're hitting our goals 100%. And we met on those and they're delivering because they might not be delivering over here, right? Right. Um, so, you know, to answer your question, how am I gonna stay ahead of the curve because social media is everywhere and so, so important, is that I'm going to companies and asking them what their actual strategy is because if they're not interested in social media, then I'm gonna focus on what they are interested in. Right. right, Because maybe they're doing a really good job of that somewhere else. Right. Or maybe they wanna enhance their social media with something that we're doing. So I, I'm tailoring my programs to each sponsor based on what their strategies are. And that could be social media or not. Right. Smart. Yeah. Very smart. All right. So that answer, folks, was kind of started by the whole question about the Azunia tequila. Now, you've also, as we mentioned early on, spent uh, a bit of time with, as the marketing VP for Kettle One. Mm -hmm. And that really was the impetus for this amazing project that you guys can all see behind Jim right now, which <laughs> is the Baja United Group. And Jim, as I said at the beginning of the onset of the show, he's the CEO of Baja United. And I, I will definitely not do this the proper justice as to how this came to be, what it's all about, and what to expect out of Baja United. So I'm going to let Jim kind of take it from his time at Kettle One and how that has evolved now into this burgeoning Baja United group that he's yeah. got going now here. Thanks for that. And you've been so kind with the compliments in my career and things I've been doing. But, um, you know, and I want to keep, because this is important to know for, for people that are watching the show, is that there is a vein of racing in everything that I've done um, later in my careers. And I've had, I would consider, four career jobs, um, two companies that I've created and two that I work for. Um, but there's always been that vein of racing in later on in life. And I think that it's important to know that because a lot of times I'll say everything that, that has happened in my life that's been great has been because of racing, including my wife and two kids. So, right on. Um, you know, but but to to run through the story, you know, I had a great career at Kettle One. Uh, they sold to a company called Diageo, or at least the American operation. So I, I needed to go find something to do. Uh, had enough money to uh, incorporate a deal with a distillery down in Mexico and start producing a tequila and created my own brand. Uh, that we had great investors and good people involved that ultimately back in January of 2017, I stepped away from, turned the company over to the investors, and really my idea was to semi-retire, you know, maybe. Right maybe, off into the desert, Yeah, so well, I wish. <laughs> you know, I knew I wanted to make some money somewhere, but the pressure wasn't there. I have a, a two-year-old and a four-year-old, and I thought, hey, this is a time in my life I can spend more time with the kids and do more things that I love, which was racing, spending time in Mexico. My wife and I absolutely love being in Mexico, whether that's uh, Baja or mainland Mexico. And I just, you know, I had these aspirations to, you know, a little bit of ride off in the sunset. But yeah. um, so my partner here at uh, Blue Sea Advertising, where we're filming today, um, Eric Morley, and I've been with him for years on different projects. Matter of fact, to divert real quick to social media, you know, when we kicked off Azunia Tequila, Eric came to me with this massive social media plan. He goes, this is how Obama got elected. Look at this plan. You know, <laughs> if you remember, Obama was great at social media. Goes, this is the plan, right? He handed me the golden egg. Yeah. And we, we launched all of our social media about the time those things launched. I mean, I was one of the first Twitter customers, the first Instagram customers, you know. So uh, anyways, Eric and I have a lot of history. And 
And Eric says, hey, Jim, you, you know, you're not working. You're like, what are you going to be doing? I said, I don't know, whatever comes away. He goes, you know, I've been telling you about wine in Baja for a long time. we got to go check it out. My wife and I have had so much fun. I said, yeah. He goes, why don't you come down there with me? Okay, yeah, when do you want to go? How about tomorrow? It wasn't, it wasn't literally tomorrow, but it was within a couple days. And I'd be, I literally had only stepped away two weeks from the tequila company. Yeah. And um, of course, I already had the honeydew list that was long. <laughs> thought, okay, let's get out of town for a day. Right. So um, I, I meet Eric and we drive down to Baja and, and he takes me to a, a winery called Santo Tomas. Been around for 100 years. They've got the original grapevine, you know. I'm like, wow, it's pretty nice. I'm not a wine drinker. Let's be clear. I did not start this as a wine drinker. I do like adventure. Um, I do like to drink, don't get me wrong, um, in moderation at the right time. But um, I thought, okay, you know, I can get behind this. So we started tasting through some of the wine there at Santa Tomas. Beautiful facility just at the entry to the Valle de Guadalupe, which is uh, about 20 minutes north of Ensenada and blows me away every time. Ensenada is only a two and a half hour drive from here in Southern California, so you don't have to fly there. Most people ask me around town, like, where do we fly into? I'm like, no, dude, you just drive across yeah, the border. Just drive. <laughs> right? Just drive. It's not that um, far. So uh, we go there, and then we, we drive down the road to another winery called El Cielo. And this place is like a Tuscan village. You know, I'm looking around. It's probably a $20 million infrastructure. And uh, we're sitting there having some sips of wine and these great hors d'oeuvres, you know, Mexican cuisine. And if you don't know, some of the top chefs in the world, the, the top 10 Michelin rated restaurants in the world, two of them are in the Valle de Guadalupe. Wow. Right? So the food is up and coming to die for, you know, anything that you would, you would want to try out of this world. That, it's there. So here we are having these appetizers and drinking some wine and Eric looks over and he goes, so what do you think? I'm like, this place is epic. I'm having a great day. You know, I'm glad you brought me down here. We're overlooking this valley and it's perfect sunshine, the great fields and everything. And a matter of fact, in the distance, there were some UTVs. They're doing a UTV tour. I'm like, oh, you know, dirt. Oh, nice. So uh, he says, well, uh, what do you think about importing wine up to the U.S.? I said, well, I've never even thought about it. He goes, well, you know, I was kind of thinking maybe we could have a little business where we import wine up to the U.S. I'm like, is that what you wanted me to come down here? Because he knew I'd been importing tequila from Mexico for years. And this was just not even a year ago. This was like last year. This was last year, February. So, so almost a year. Almost a year, right? So I'm like, yeah, not a bad idea. So we leave that winery. We go on to another place called Monte Chenique. Uh, they just celebrated their 30 year anniversary down there. First winery to put out a luxury wine out of uh, Mexico, the entire country, right? And uh, the day just kept getting better. Stayed in the hotel on the beach, you know, we went to the taco stands we love. And, and on the drive back, he says, no, Jim, I'm really serious. I'd like to import wine, you know, maybe as a hobby or, you know, I think there's a need down here. I said, oh, might be something worth thinking about. So we go home and a week later, he's like, hey, let's go back down to Baja and really explore that notion. So this, this plan started developing of like, okay, we're going to, I talked myself into importing wine, you know, but, um, so the second trip we went down there was really about meeting some of the wineries and finding out what their needs were. And um, I, on that trip, I said to Eric, this is really important to me as he and I had been working with the orphanages in Baja the last 10 years. And we've worked with some of the major car manufacturers like Magnaflow and uh, I know Yokohama Tire was involved, um, General Tire was involved, you know, a lot of these great companies, Monster Energy. So uh, we've been doing this for a long time. He said, look, Eric, if we're gonna import wine and, and create this little business, let's make it a sustainable business that we can donate a percentage of proceeds back to the orphanages. You know, and for me, we'd go down to race in Mexico and part of that race effort, we'd stop by the orphanages and donate money and food and, you know, throw a barbecue for the kids and maybe we'd paint and help repair things with the team. And, but it was only once or twice a year. And they send out newsletters every month and you see what their needs are. And it's like, wow, I really would like to help them on a regular basis. And so that's, that's what struck a chord with me is if we're going to create a business here, let's create a sustainable business that donates back to them on a regular basis. So uh, we agreed on that. Um, and to kind of wrap the story a little bit is uh, we wound up uh, garnering some contracts with these top wineries, the three that I mentioned we're working with, and uh, we're importing their wines. And uh, in the middle of all that, I called my wine uh, or my distributor partner up here in the U.S. Young's Market Company. Uh, they've been around 100 years as well one of the top distributors in the u.s especially when it comes to brand building i said hey guys what, what do you think about Baja wines and uh, i was surprised at the answer and it was 
we've been looking for an importer of olive wines for six months. We'll take whatever you got. So uh, wow. literally, we launched the company with a purchase order from Young's Market Company to bring the wine in. So it couldn't have gotten any better. That's, it sounds like it's all about the timing on that from a number of standpoints. But as I asked you prior to the show, it's like, you know, Baja hasn't really had that a reputation of being known for wines, yeah. but yet they've been around for over a hundred years, some of them. Yeah. So how did that, it, it, I know we kind of joked about it before the show, but you know, it certainly doesn't, that, that region doesn't have the reputation of other well-known wine regions in the world. What's changed? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell, say this publicly again, because I think it's important. We are on the cusp of Baja being the next Napa. Okay, so you know, when I talk, I talk a lot about infrastructure. And when you drive through that valley and you look at the LCLO property or multi Chenique property, which is state of the art wine facilities, and you realize that there's some heavy investments going on down there. And what's happened is a lot of people have migrated from Mexico City as passion projects to build these wineries. They're hiring some of the best winemakers around the world. And what they identified, some of them early on, like Montuchini, because I said they're on their 30-year anniversary, is they realized that that valley right there is a special area for growing grapes. They have a hot climate in the day, and then they get that ocean breeze and fog overnight from Ensenada, and it socks it in, so you've got cool nights. Hot days, cool nights is perfect weather for, for growing grapes. And um, they've gotten really good at it. And they're passionate about it, like what you saw in the early years at Napa. You know, before Napa was on the map, we're talking about dirt roads and pioneers and what they were doing. You know, the French were laughing at them, and there was that big contest where Napa wines went over yeah, and won the true. contest. Same thing's going to happen down here, and uh, it's so exciting for me because when I look at it, I'm not looking at the bottle that's on the shelf here at, at your local grocery store that finally showed up. I'm down there looking at what the passion and the financial resources they're putting into these products and where they're going with them and learning about their business plans and the winemakers. Um, so I, I know that this thing's really moving in the right direction. And, and you can find articles in, in Vogue magazine, New York Times, The Post, um, Sunset Magazine just did a great article uh, two months ago about Baja and they're all calling it the next Napa. Um, there's other grape growing areas. There's a couple here in California and Southern California that they do an okay job but it's not what's happening down in Baja, and it's really exciting. So if you haven't tried Baja wines, time to get after it. Um, and just know, I'm calling it out, that we are on the cusp of something big, and I'm very fortunate to be at the forefront of that. It's, it sounds like that area, especially the wine, but the food as well, and, and just the general area, is, is kind of been one of these almost best-kept secret mm -hmm. kind of things. Yeah, absolutely. From, absolutely. That's, that's phenomenal. So to that point, Calling, calling the seventh gear nation out to, to get on board with these these wines. Obviously, gang, you see that, that Jim has brought a, a pretty good selection <laughs> of wines with him here today. So Jim, tell us a little bit about what we've got from a, the whole gamut of wines that, that you guys offer right now. Well, um, we, we've been doing a lot of work with Monty Chenique recently, and uh, Chenique starts with an X. Uh, and I love the name. If you see their logo on the bottle, it's a, it's a flower. Uh, with some vines around it. So Monte would be the mountain and Chenique is the first flower that comes out after the first rain in Baja. So pretty cool tribute to the land. That is pretty and, cool. And one of the things that you learn about Baja wines is that the land and the minerals and the soil is very unique, which produces such uh, an incredible grape to make these wines. Um, I love the brand because they have some traditional blends. Baja is known for having a lot of blends like a Tempranillos and Malbecs and Chenin Columbars. Um, whereas for the most part, Monte Chenique has kind of some straightforward Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, um, which is a great intro for you know, American consumers and people around the world because they're familiar with the blend. Then they can compare it to something else that they normally drink, right? Um, whereas you look at some of the other wineries, they start to get real fancy. Like I said, they are pioneers. The wine is incredible, but you're less inclined to try those crazy blends you've never heard of, right. um, as opposed to some of these traditional ones. So, you know, for us, it's about brand building and, and, and getting the name out there. Um, we are absolutely taking it serious, as well as Young's Market Company, that we're building a category, that we want to do a service for the entire wine valley and build the category up here. So we're not just promoting the brands that we have, we're promoting the valley. And 
I envision you walk into a liquor store or a grocery store to buy wine, you usually see California wines, Italy, France, well, one day you're going to see Mexico or Baja, right, as a category. And so we're taking our position and our role very seriously that we're, we're building a category, we're building a business, and then we're helping these brands launch. What's, what's great about what's here, by the way, um, is that we have Monte Chenique, 30 years, state-of-the-art facility, every modern you know, piece of equipment there, and an incredible winemaker, right next to my uh, Valley Girl wine, <laughs> which um, she, she has a you know, great, fun logo, but Satara, who's the winemaker there, she is the complete opposite. You pull up to her place, and there's a trailer that looks like it could either be her house or the winery. You walk inside, and you realize it's both. <laughs> you know, um, but she's a winemaker, so she goes down the road to the school, and uh, she makes her wine there and brings it back to her property, and, and it's bottled, and you can buy and taste and all those things. But Sitar is that person that landed in Mexico and says, I have a dream. I, I want to make Baja wines, you know, and I want to be a part of this culture, right? And so she put out Valley Girl. And, and I think she makes great wine, but I think her story is even better. And uh, so we're going to follow her story along and help her build her brand here in the U.S. So I love what she's doing. And, um, you know, she's kind of the epitome of, you know, that startup story. Like I'm in, you know, foreign land and, uh, you know, she's got her dogs, you know, running around the yard and stuff. And you sit at a picnic table and taste wine. I love that. So, uh, yeah, and, and we hope to bring that spirit of adventure and bought it to our customers. You know, we uh, not only can you buy the wine online, buy United Wines, but um, you can also, we can arrange for tours. We have a partnership with a company called Boca Roja. And you could book a tour. If you could fly in to San Diego, they'll pick you up. They'll take you down for a day or two days or however long you want to be there. And then they'll start exploring through our partner uh, wineries down there. And you can enjoy that Mexico experience and taste some of those great restaurants. And uh, they'll get you across the border to and fro, you know, without any issues. They've got all the fancy passes and the van that slides right through. So it's, it's our goal and vision to um, promote the tourism of Baja and a country that we love so much that we started out surfing and racing in. And, uh, you know, we, we want to show people that going down to Mexico is not only safe and fun, but it's adventurous and, and you can, you know, do the wine trips and the surf trips and all that other stuff. So uh, we, we've already expanded our business, as you said. We, you know, we started almost a year ago, but uh, we have importation with the distributors. We've got over, I think, 125 bars and restaurants now selling our brands locally. We've got our direct uh, to consumer website and we have a partnership with the tour company. Um, and then of course we've got the charity organization. So we've got four legs already to this business. But, that and that was actually, and I'm glad you said that because that was gonna be one of my next questions. For those of you that are wanting to try this based on all the great things that we've just heard about this region and these wines, what's the best place for them to find these, Jim? Go, go to BajaUnitedWines.com. Uh, we've got uh, info at Baja United Wines. You can send in your request, but uh, the wines are for sale there. You can click on the tour button, and we can talk about tours and getting you all set up. It's it's so easy. It's safe. I just took uh, on Saturday. We did uh, 20 Latina bloggers from LA. Two vans went down. We had the greatest time, and we just did a one day turnaround. Uh, started early, came home late. The, the ladies had a blast. Um, but you know, it could be as easy as that. There's never enough time. They all wish they were staying the night to do it again. So right. I would say plan on staying a night or two and, and really enjoying the experience. But yeah, go to Baja United Wines and you know, reach out. That's fantastic. So do you anticipate that the, the lineup of wines is going to expand? Will it contract? Will it change? How are you, what is your vision for that as you see things right now? Well, right now we have uh, 26 different varietals on our website with five different wineries. And uh, we've got a list of wineries that want to work with us now. I mean, we've really put our best foot forward. If you look at our website, you can tell we Blue Sea Advertising's done a phenomenal job with their assets and, and the support mechanism. So they know we're serious about this. Um, so we anticipate that growing. Um, I know that it's in the works, but Mexico as a country uh, will be promoting the wines of Mexico and we've already been approached to be their preferred vendor for those wines and three of our wines are already in that portfolio so um, we do anticipate it growing uh, but what we see is uh, I'm a big fan of Jimmy Buffett and what he's done with his organization he's kind of like that octopus head with all these tentacles a very good friend that ran that company for years 
And I envision us doing the same with Baha'i United is having some tentacles where we can deliver all different aspects of, ba of the Baha'i experience from wine. Uh, we're looking at a beer expansion. Uh, you're reading right, my mind, right, Jim. Right down there. You're reading my mind. I was going to say, you've got that coming online soon, too. Yeah, we, we've got a, a Baja United Cerveza coming online that I'm really excited about. I do drink beer and have, so that was an easy transition for me. Uh, but we're, we're working with some craft breweries down in, in Mexico. Um, you know, so we're, we're opening up those doors so people can experience more of, of Baja, you know? That's Unbelievable, it's, and it's a great story. And to think that you've done this all in basically less than a year's time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, that, that's full that's, throttle, right? <laughs> full throttle. See, it always has that, 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 that racing thread. Yeah. But that's kudos to you and Eric for for being able to get that that done that quickly. And just to be clear too, that whether it's the the wine sales or once the beer comes online, a portion of those sales proceeds go to the orphanages back in Baja. Right? Yeah, you'll see very prevalent on our on our website, any of our materials. We work with a company called Corazon de Vida, and they work with 10 orphanages a year. Um, we realized very quickly that we couldn't vet all the orphanages and, and put our money where we were comfortable with because we're just we're not down there enough. Corazon de Vida has a vetting process. They've been doing this for many, many years. Matter of fact, the founder, Hilda, uh, grew up in an orphanage that we used to support, so a small world there. Wow. Um, but we, we donate to them, and then they take care of the projects. Uh, this year, specifically in 2018, we're working on building an addition to an orphanage in the city of Tijuana that can accommodate uh, newborn babies. Um, oh, and, wow. and nowadays, with the federal regulations in Mexico, and yes, they do have regulations, um, there's no orphanages that can accommodate babies. So we're working on building a wing that can uh, legally uh, take in these babies and, and have a place for them if they were born and given up, um, that, that they can go there. So we're thrilled to be working with them. Percentage, 3% uh, specifically goes to Corazon de Vida of every sale. So, wow. Yeah, yeah we're ha real happy to be partnered with them. They're great people. That's that's a great cause, a great cause, and I'm just uh, and seventh gear fans. In fact, I'm gonna I'm gonna come around here for for a minute. I I am more than and hopefully seventh gear. You guys are, are duly impressed with our, our new friend here, Jim, and, and the Baja United Group and everything that they're doing. The philanthropists, they're doing good for good. They're leaders. They're racers. Genuinely good guys. I can't thank Jim and, and his partner Eric Morley enough, along with Blue Sea Advertising, for letting us come hang out here with them for for uh, a little bit here, taking yeah, time out of their day to talk about good. these great wines. Um, I think some of these may disappear into my bag here when I leave <laughs> Seventh Year Nation. Um, if you want, you can PM me on that. But um, so, gang, I had a great time here. I'm so appreciative for Jim and, and Eric for for taking the time to talk to us about. Your racing background, yeah, especially Baja United, this is a fantastic company. I, I strongly encourage you guys, BajaUnitedWines.com. Yep, BajaUnitedWines.com. Right? Right? Check them out on Facebook as well, right? Yep. Twitter? Twitter, Baja United Wines. Am I missing anything You're on Snapchat? Um, I, I am. You can catch me at Jim Riley Racing, R-I-L-E-Y, Jim Riley Racing. Check him racing. out. Oh, that's one other question. I saw, because I started following you on Instagram <laughs> recently, you just won like a Ironman or a, some kind of triathlon. Something yeah, it's, like it, it's probably a whole new show, but I, you know, one of the reasons why I always had these lofty goals each year is because I wanted to stay in physical shape for racing. So um, by having a, a goal like climbing this mountain, I would be forced to train for that, right? Because you'd go up there and die. Um, so last year I started racing the Spartan race series, ah, that's which it. is that's obstacle right. course racing with the mileage. So you've got what they call sprint three to five miles with 20 obstacles and then a super, which is eight to 10 miles with 30 obstacles and then a beast, which is uh, 13 miles plus more obstacles. Uh, their big thing is if you run one of each, you get a trifecta. And of course we're all overachievers. So of course. I had to get a trifecta. Um, I actually got two last year. My wife got two. Uh, Samantha just been crushing it out there. And what, what was happening, not to get too far off the path, but A, I was getting healthier and stronger. Um, I went from, on some of our longer races, like the Baja 1000, getting out of the car and being dead for a week. Yeah. I get out of the car and I go back to the gym the following day and I'm playing with my kids because I've got the health to do it. But uh, within the Spartan series, there's open class, which is what we were racing. And we started finding ourselves passing a lot of people, you know, and I, and my wife was getting frustrated. She's like, wow, we're, all these people are in the way. I said, well, we should probably enter competitive. <laughs> so we do. She goes and wins the first race. She signs up for competitive. I think I got eighth. 
Um, but so then we started racing competitively. I wound up pulling two first place out of last year. She got three, and I got one other podium. I think she got a couple other podiums. So this year we're racing the full series, competitive series. Um, I did win the season opener this last Sunday uh, for the for my age group, and um, right it qualifies me for the nationals because if you get first, second, or third in your in your category, you automatically qualify for the nationals. So going to the nationals. But I've got a full season of racing in, in the Spartan Series. So that's awesome. a great time. That's awesome. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. All right. So, Seventh Gear Nation, we're going to sign off for now. Be sure to tune back in two weeks from, from our show here tonight, which will be the March 1st show. And we'll have a whole other program, new guests. Stay tuned. Look for the updates. And once again, thanks so much, Jim Riley. Thank we you. Really appreciate you taking the time with us today at Seventh Gear Nation. Check him out. Check out Baja United Wines. And until two weeks from now, be greater. Awesome. See ya.